disturbing news about Iran's nuclear program, but will it bring a new round of sanctions? Back on the up, confidence creeps back into the region's stock markets, but how long can it last? Online takeover, Yahoo ends its search for an Arab partner, but what will the deal mean for Maktoub's customers? And taking in the charms of Marrakesh, we spend a day with the tour guide who shows the stars around the sites. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Nima Abuarde and you join us in Dubai. Now, Iran is back in the news this week. It's been condemned by the West for lying to the international nuclear watchdog about its enrichment program. And this is putting pressure on countries like Russia and China to take a tougher stance with Iran. But could it result in new sanctions? This report from Jeremy Howell. The United States. When Iran revealed its second base for the refinement of nuclear fuels, President Obama lost no time in telling the world it was proof Iran has been running a nuclear weapons program and that it has been deceiving the international nuclear energy watchdog. Iran said it was proof of its honesty. But the US is hoping to persuade the United Nations Security Council to pass a new round of sanctions to try and make it stop its nuclear fuel enrichment. The Russians um, have shown that uh, they are willing now to uh, get more serious about sanctions uh, and to accept it. Uh, China so far is, seems to be reluctant. This is not surprising. China imports over 400,000 barrels of Iranian crude a day and Chinese firms have acquired contracts worth hundreds of billions of dollars to develop Iran's oil and gas fields as Western firms have pulled out. They are kind of threatening the Europeans indirectly that if you uh, withdraw your investments over here, uh, most likely they, we, uh, the Chinese will fill in uh, for you. Uh, so they'll be playing the powers against each other. But European energy firms have been pulling out of Iran, and this has left its oil and gas sector in a decrepit state. Iran continues to have huge challenges. Uh, according to some estimates, uh, more than $19 billion is required as of now in the oil and gas sector uh, in order to pick up its uh, capacity. And again, this is the lifeline of, of Iran, the oil and gas sector. If Iran's uh, oil and gas, gas sector does not receive the necessary investments, the economy is going to come to its knees. The last time the United Nations Security Council passed sanctions against Iran was in March 2008. It blacklisted firms, people and banks thought to be channeling money to Iran's nuclear program. The United States would like to strengthen the sanctions by blocking exports of refined oil to Iran. It has little refining capacity of its own, and already the government has been forced to ration petrol at the pumps, causing public anger. But can the United States manage to put such a ban in place? Unless the Americans come in and say, we have alternative customers to sell your refined products to, then we're really asking countries like India to take a huge hit in their export earnings. So we would be hurting some of our allies if we did this. There's one set of allies which the United States is putting particular pressure on at the moment to sever its economic links with Iran, and that's the Gulf states, especially places like here, Dubai which last year exported $11 billion worth of goods to Iran. The Gulf states say they'll comply with the United Nations sanctions against Iran, but won't go any further for America's sake, for fear of reprisals. The general perception in the Arab Gulf countries is that Iran is getting its way, uh, and the US and the West will not be able to stop Iran from building it as a, a nuclear program. And therefore, there is no interest for them to uh, make enemies with Iran. The West need to convince the Arab Gulf countries that they can win this confrontation with Iran and that they can get Iran uh, to uh, concede to their demands. This week, Iran conducted trials with Shahab-3 long-range missiles. Many military analysts think it'll be only three years or so before Iran is able to arm them with nuclear warheads. 
and it doesn't seem that the US can get international support for any sanctions measures tough enough to persuade Iran to abandon its nuclear program. Jeremy Howell reporting there. Now there are more than 320 million Arabic speakers around the world, but less than 1% of online content is in Arabic. It's a huge potential market. And that's why international companies like Yahoo are expanding here. Yahoo recently bought the Arabic online portal, Maktoub. But what difference will the deal make to Maktoub's 16 million users? The question I put to Ahmed Nasif, general manager of Maktoub.com. Oh, they're going to get uh, a lot out of this. And not just our users, but Arab users in general. There are 50 million internet users in the Arab world today. That number is probably going to double in the next three years. So what happens now is, for the first time, Arab users have access to global, world-class platforms that Yahoo has. Yahoo leads all over the world in, in mail, in, uh, in messenger, in all these global media properties like news and finance and entertainment. You have all the access to all this in Arabic and in localized, customized content that they care about that combines international content as well as their local content. So can you break it down for me? How, how is it going to really work? Basically, with this deal, Yahoo uh, starts, after this deal completes, with an operation um, that's very active already in, in the region. We have offices in Jordan, in Egypt, in Kuwait, in Saudi Arabia, in Dubai. So already we have a regional reach. We have uh, a group of, uh, of writers and editors and, and experts in the region. So we'll be able to take advantage of the knowledge that Maktoub brings, which is the knowledge of the region, customized content, and we're going to combine that with email services and instant messaging and search and so on. All of these different services will now be Arabized. So you put these two things together and you finally have an offering that, that, that Arab internet users really deserve. Arabic speakers might deserve the content, but do they have money to spend? A company today uh, can't ignore, can't afford to ignore 50 million Arab users. Uh, and when you look at that 50 million population, that's going to be 100 million in a few years. These tend to be the most educated uh, members of society. These are the ones with uh, the power to buy and you know, purchase. So uh, any kind of business, they need to be in that space. If they're not, then they're missing an opportunity to communicate and engage with their customers. But it has been said that the most educated, the up and coming ones, actually don't use Arabic at all as their medium. We had the same experience. In the first couple of years, most of our users used our English interface, 80% in the beginning used our English interface over Arabic. But we knew the trend in the Arab world isn't going to be any different from the trend in Russia, in China, all over in, in South America. Um, as more and more people come online, you're going to have uh, more and more emphasis on local languages. Today, 80% of our users, um, actually more than that, use our Arabic interface. We've stopped uh, rolling out a lot of our services in English because it's just uh, you know, all the interest. When you look at countries like Saudi Arabia, Egypt, uh, most people today who are just going online, all of these folks want Arabic content. They want localized, customized information. Ahmed Nasif, the general manager of Maktoub.com, speaking to me earlier. Right, let's take a look at some other business news making headlines. Investment Dar, which owns half of the British luxury car maker Aston Martin, has reached a deal with its creditors to give it more time to pay off its debts. Earlier this year, the Kuwaiti company defaulted on a $100 million Islamic bond after facing financing problems. The latest Gulf investor to eye up Liverpool Football Club is Prince Faisal bin Fahid bin Abdullah Saud. He wants to buy a 50% stake in the club, according to a report in a Riyadh newspaper. The Saudi prince was at Anfield last Saturday to watch Liverpool beat Hull. And despite the economic gloom, spending on infrastructure in the Gulf is expected to reach $205 billion by 2013, according to Standard Chartered Bank. Most of the Gulf's infrastructure projects, like Dubai Metro, are government-backed, so are less affected by the global economic downturn. Well, we're going to take a short break now, and when we come back, we'll be meeting the guide who shows the stars the sights of Marrakesh. We'll be talking to him about why he swapped teaching for tourism. <laughs> Welcome back to the program. I'm Nima Abuarte, and you join us at Dubai's financial market. Confidence is creeping back into stock markets in the region. Red arrows are turning green, and markets are on the up. Here in Dubai, recently shares hit a 10-month high and an 11-month high in Saudi Arabia. But is the growth sustainable? Here's Ben Thompson.
The Middle East stock markets have been in poor health. After a big fall in December, they've struggled to get back on their feet. Trading has been slow, foreign investors have stayed away, and even government injections of cash haven't been enough to revive their ailing fortunes. But then, in a surprise move, signs that the sick markets could finally be on the mend. And for traders on stock exchanges right around the region, that couldn't come soon enough. In a year of heavy losses and damaged confidence, the Green Arrows are a welcome sight. It was very difficult. We were suffering a lot, but the bad day is finished and we hope everything just goes up. It was very bad, very bad, especially in Dubai. Yani. Very, very bad. The real estate sector in Dubai uh, yani, was uh, really, really damaged. Yani. The investor lost, lost hope in the market, lost a lot of money, lost hope. So they, they starting to keep out of the market. Now everybody's happy. So what's behind the rise? Some say it's simply the knock-on effect of rising markets in Asia and the West. Others say it's a sign that the worst is now over. But there is evidence that foreign investors are now back. Many of them fled last year, sending the markets here sliding. But their return could signal more confidence in the region and the opportunity to recoup some of their losses. If you're an investor, you suddenly have become very conservative. But when you see uh, the markets uh, rolling back up, you will not be able to resist for long. You know? And you will try to recover some of the losses that uh, you have suffered. If you look at it, the volatility has always been higher in the emerging markets. But volatility means that um, there will be sharp decline as well. But when it, things will recover, they will outperform any other markets in the world. And I think if somebody wants to uh, recover some of the losses uh, they have uh, s suffered, this would be the market they should uh, put their money in. Here on the Abu Dhabi Stock Exchange, trade has now finished for the day and the market has closed up, but only just. And that's a sign of the confidence that's slowly creeping back into the market here. But despite that, traders and investors still remain cautious. Many of them lost money when the market slumped last year. And they now say there's real concern that the optimism that's helping to push up the markets now is based more on hope and expectation rather than evidence of a real and solid recovery in the economy. There is a bit of that, I think, in the sense that if you want, you, we want something so much to happen and we all agree to that it should happen, it may happen, you know. Uh, we're all saying that there's going to be, everybody believes there's going to be an end of year rally in the, in the equity markets, and that's why everybody's buying ahead, and that's really what's making that momentum continue. But does that mean that we are going to go back to the years of two years ago? I don't think so, and nobody is, is that naive, I think. But we, we are recovering from the over panic that we saw end of 2008. And we're going to, that's what we're enjoying at the moment. There's a, a, you know, a, a positive euphoria going, building up there. Foreigners are, are you know, Sometimes you think the locals may be just over uh, optimistic, but when you have foreign institutions going and putting money, heavy money, you're talking about nearly a billion dirhams. That's, that's a positive statement of people's belief going forward. And that's a trend investors are hoping can continue. Markets here do remain at the mercy of the US, Europe and Asia. But they're also feeling the benefit of domestic improvements too. Higher, more stable oil prices are helping, as are the better than expected company results. And with many stocks now going cheap, local buyers are following foreign investors back into the markets. And that's just the sort of medicine the markets need. Ben Thompson reporting there. Now the giants of the coffee shop world like Starbucks and Costa are as widespread here in the Middle East as they are in the West. But Syria, which for years was cut off from American brands, created its very own coffee shop chains. And this week, the first of them has ventured abroad, setting up a branch in the Gulf Emirate of Sharjah. It's called In House and it aims to open 50 cafes across the Middle East over the next five years. One of its selling points is that it offers a more Middle Eastern flavour with its coffees and food. But what's it really got to take on the giants of the sector? A question I put to Amar Taqiddin, Chief Operating Officer of In House. 
I used to live in the States for a while. I lived there, you know, I used to, I used to go star, to Starbucks, I used to go to other coffee shops. I had a feeling that there's a lot of things missing that I wanted to bring in. Like the Arab, Arabic culture is different than the Western culture. Here, Arabic culture, people like to be treated the way they are used to be treated. So the table service is one of them. And we also add some stuff to our menu, which is also an Arabic feel. For example, we have Turkish coffee in our menu. So, and, 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 and I guess no other coffee shop chain has Turkish coffee in their, in their menu. So we kind of have an Arabic feel in our, in, in, in our not, not only in our menu, but in our environment. You are expanding out of Syria. This is your first move out of your home turf. Are you confident you're going to make it? You're going to be up against the big boys? Well, you know what? The last few years in Syria, the big boys you're talking about are, are there now. We, we are perfectly good. We are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are in a position that we're very comfortable with ourselves from what we have uh, in, uh, in our menu, what we have in our skills, what we have in, you know, we have a lot of stuff that we're unique in. We are very comfortable that we could do it. Why did you choose to launch in the United Arab Emirates as opposed to Saudi Arabia? You had an offer from Saudi. It's a much, much bigger market there. Starting in the UAE outside Syria is better than starting in Saudi Arabia because of the different cultures, because of the different exposure. Uh, uh, a lot of tourists come to UAE. So people coming to UAE, seeing in house coffee uh, is much stronger than seeing it anywhere else in the Middle East. Is this a good business to be in? In, in our culture, people, you know, this is the way they entertain. In our culture, people go out, sit in cafes. It's different than the Western culture. People, this is, this is their entertainment. They go, sit at cafes, drink, eat, talk, uh, relax, chill down. This is their entertainment. So uh, this is why it's a good, you know, the best thing in the, in, in, in the, in, in the, in the Middle East is a cafe to, you know, uh, to, to get traffic. Now, 8 million people visited Morocco last year. Along with agriculture, tourism is one of the country's top employers. Well, Malcolm Borthwick was there recently. He spent the day with one of the country's top tour guides, Mohamed Zahidi, who shows stars like Robert De Niro the sights of Marrakesh. Uh, we are here in this, which is well, I was in teaching before, and uh, before even I went into teaching, I always uh, loved um, tourism. Uh, but the time I went to teach, and actually it coincided with a time of crisis in tourism with the first Gulf War. So I just uh, had to find a job, actually. I went to teaching. It was not the kind of job that I was born to do, actually, especially that I was teaching a bunch of teenagers that were not interested in a foreign language that I was teaching them. I was trying to really draw their attention to the importance of this language. But unfortunately, uh, it, was, it was really tough. And then by the end, I decided to go to tourism that I all the time loved before. Then I've been working in tourism now for like 14 years. Uh, I love it. It's also kind of teaching if you want, but you meet with mature people and you're teaching them about your country, about the culture, about the history, about the people. Uh, but also uh, you get to meet really uh, a, lot, uh, a wide range of people in this kind of job, which is quite interesting. I start my tour here because this is what I consider to be the cradle of Marrakesh. That's where the first dynasty that founded the city of Marrakesh in the 11th century started uh, building a palace which became the center of its power from which they ruled a huge empire that included Spain, North Africa, up to the border between Algeria and Tunisia, and all the way to Senegal. My job involves, uh, you know, taking people around the city of Marrakesh and showing them their historical sites and uh, uh, taking around the Medina, which is an alive museum, like you see here. The museums that the Medina has and uh, palaces and the, the uh, gardens that the city of Marrakesh also has. Besides, of course, the famous square of Marrakesh that has snake charmers, acrobats, fortune tellers storytellers, musicians, dancers, food stands and stalls, and it all comes alive and really vibrant with life towards sunset. And it's a place that is a big attraction for the locals and tourists alike. Well, tourism is very important in Morocco, uh, to in, in the country, or for the country in general, because uh, it's often uh, the major source of income and for foreign currency in the country. Well, it's true that uh, we uh, have seen, uh, you know, tourists or the types of tourists uh, change. Uh, it's true that before uh, people would spend more money. Uh, now, uh, people would spend less money. 
And you know, for tourism to become a, a very important source of income for the locals and a very important industry for the country, then visitors, of course, need to spend money, okay? And if they don't do that, uh, then of course, it doesn't bring as much money as it brings to just uh, restaurants and hotels and transportation of tourism. And a lot of people come with some prejudice, okay, because of what's going on in media, uh, on TVs in Europe and America, and all that is going on in the world now everybody knows. It is true that uh, people, when they get here, a lot of people actually express it, that they are quite surprised. Uh, people coming from anywhere just feel comfortable here. You be it a Jew or a Christian or anybody, no matter what they are, come into here, they find these people that are so moderate in everything and have this wonderful balance between life and religion. You can see a woman dressed like a Westerner, but when it's time for prayer, she will go home or to a mosque, she wears her jalaba, she's totally covered, she says her prayers, that's something personal, and she will go out and look the way she likes, she's free to behave the way she likes. Sometimes you're walking down the street, you can see two sisters walking together, one totally covered and one, you know, not covered, just dressed like a European or an American. And people respect each other's thoughts and philosophy, which is a wonderful thing in this country. Mohammed Zahidi speaking to Malcolm Borthwick there. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the programme. We just have time to find out whether it was red arrows or green arrows for the markets this week. And remember, we'd love to hear from you. Our address is middleeastbiz at bbc.co.uk. Now, next week, we're back in Morocco to find out whether the country's all-important textile industry is suffering as a result of European consumers reigning in spending. So until then, from me, Nima Abuarte, and the rest of the team, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.